Okay, here we go. All right, it surprisingly has a, a fair little amount of kick. Well, welcome to the Cinnabar. Now that was the first time I'd ever shot an original 1866 Winchester. And I have to admit, I enjoyed the experience immensely. Now that carbine come in needing a new barrel. Um, so we'd had some mechanical work to do to it. Then we had some finishing work we had to do to it and, and some aging to make everything look right. And then we had the added challenge of getting some ammunition that would fire through the, the gun. So stick around, we'll show you kind of an overview of what it took to get there. Now that particular one was a, a center fire version and if you stick around to the end we might even shoot it a few more times. And we we'll hope to real soon do a another episode, kind of a follow up with this carbine that hasn't been converted to center fire. This one's still a rim fire. So if you're interested in that, make sure and keep an eye out for that one coming up. The fact that it's a center fire then led to why it's here in the shop today. Because the owner of this, this uh, carbine just couldn't stand it. Being a center fire cartridge um, and, and the, the uh, brass is available, it's, it's reformed from 44 Special, I think. Um, so he, he couldn't stand it. He, he wanted to shoot this gun. He wasn't a reloader himself, so he sent the brass to um, an outfit who is a professional reloader or professional professionally loads obsolete cartridges shall we say um, and unfortunately they loaded it very very light and he asked them to load it light because he didn't want to take any chances he wanted to be very very careful not to hurt the gun but unfortunately we can cause some problems by loading too light as well and what, what happened is and if I remember correctly he said that they loaded it with something like four grains of trail boss and anyway he said it was it was shooting really low even at 50 yards like 16 inches low at 50 yards and then unfortunately he got a squib and didn't realize it and then shot through it so we've got a barrel here with the with the squib in it and a and a bulge down here and about a two inch crack and we'll take a little closer look at that in, in a minute so we needed a new barrel for this 66 and and so we he originally sent it to me and wanted me to uh, reline the barrel, but after seeing the, the big crack in it, uh, you know, that it just wasn't in the cards. We weren't going to play around with, with something like that. So ended up um, sending, sending it off to winchesterbarrels.com down in, in Florida. And this is the first barrel I've had done with those folks. Um, didn't really know what to expect. Now, now the only issue I really had was th that they... They, they talked about it being a, a eight to 10 week project and it, and it took considerably longer. But I've heard that from, from several other people that, that they do pretty good work, but it, it takes a while. So you have to be patient. And, and it was about seven months before we got this barrel back. Um, and we just, just got it back recently, but they did an, a beautiful job with it and, and really at a reasonable price. So this this barrel, I, I was just really, really impressed with it. And, and I certainly will give them more business. In fact, uh, I'm, uh, I've got a couple of barrels that I'm ready to order from them right now. Um, so, so basically what we're gonna do now is we have to put some finish on this thing because now we've got this bright, shiny new barrel here that doesn't match the patina of the rest of the gun. Now, this this particular saddle ring carbine has been completely cleaned all surfaces there's no original finish zero original finish on this saddle ring carbine so we're really starting with a clean slate and it's going to make it easier in a way because we're not going to try to have to match this barrel to the original finish that would have been on this particular gun uh, before it was cleaned and they've done some of our polishing work the polishing work the pits have been removed um, so so there's some advantages there. It's going to make my job a little bit easier. But of course the disadvantage is that there, there isn't any original finish. And the, the, the brass parts, and I know I'm going to get in trouble for calling them brass because um, while we, the, the collector terminology for the 66s and the Henrys is brass frames, 
Um, serious collectors will tell you they're not brass at all. They're actually what was called at the time gun metal, which is a, a bronze alloy instead of a brass alloy. Um, of course, I think we all know what the term brass frame re refers to if you're involved in collecting. But the brass has all been been cleaned but it, quite a while ago, so that's why I'm wearing the gloves because it's starting to get some patina back, it's starting to get that mustard appearance that it should have and the, the oils off our hands and gun oils and things like that takes that patina off of, of these um, brass or bronze frame. Uh, so. So we're going to be very careful to try to, to maintain that finish. And it takes decades to get that finish. So, so you know, I don't want to take any of it off in the process of, of uh, working on this gun and getting the rest of the parts done. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, slow rust blue all the exterior steel parts, barrel, mag tube. You can see the butt plate's been really polished up quite shiny, um, our, our barrel bands here, and, and then try to match everything. And we'll, we'll, we'll go back and put a little wear on these parts, a little high edge wear and whatnot, but we're not gonna go to the extent of going and trying to put a, whole, a bunch of dings in it and, and really trying to make it look like it's 100% it's original because that's a, a nearly impossible thing to do in, in this situation where we don't have original finish on any of the parts to match it to. So stick with us. We're gonna we're gonna start getting these these parts polished up and cleaned up and ready to slow rust blue, and then we're gonna put the whole thing together. And and uh, as an added bonus, we might even take this gun out and test fire it a couple of times. Okay, so we're gonna start polishing in preparation for our rust bluing with this magazine tube. Now, as I said earlier, the, the finish has all been removed off of the steel parts on this rifle, or this carbine, and it was done years and years ago, and it's, of course it's been unprotected since. So we've got some rust showing up, particularly along the seam here, uh, quite a bit of, of staining and, and whatnot. So we're gonna clean this up and just see what the finish looks like on it, and then try to match the other parts to it when we see what, what it's gonna look like when we're done. Now, we need to get this, this uh, plug out and then we can put it between centers on the lathe and, and, and go over and then start polishing. I it did I was able to get the, the screw out of this plug but it took some heating and some some um, tapping and some croil and it was really rusty and now this plug isn't even budging so we're, we're gonna have to drive it out and I've got a dowel here to do that. So I'm thinking that we're we're pretty rusty in there. Well that came out a little easier than what I was thinking it would but it is just solid red rust nasty some of that coral got in there and that, that helped to get it out of there now let's see what we've got here oh my goodness yes when they cleaned this they uh, they cleaned the outside but they didn't clean the inside of the tube and it's really rusty so we're gonna have to take a minute go over and uh, get some some uh, sandpaper and, and run up and down that and see if we can't clean the inside out. And worst case scenario, if it doesn't clean up, we'll take it over to the uh, blasting cabinet and run some media through it. All right, so we've got some 220 grit emery cloth on this long dowel. Just gonna work it back and forth in there. We put a little gun oil on it just kind of as a lubricant. Get in there. There we go. Okay, let's see how we did. Wow, that cleaned up beautifully. I really wasn't expecting that. I don't even see pitting in there. It was just pretty ugly with rust is all. So, let's get over to lathe and get the outside looking that good. Now because the steel parts on this 66 have been previously polished, it's going to make our job quite a little bit easier on polishing. And we don't use buffing wheels on high value guns here. You know, if somebody brings in a $200 shotgun to be re then we'd probably buff that rather than going through all the steps of hand polishing. 
But on this one, if, if it still had all the pits, and I'm sure that when they polished it the first time that, you know, the, the rust was enough that it was probably pitted. And we can see just the remnants of the bottom of some pits that they didn't get all the way out. And so we would have to go through and, and draw file those pits out. And then we'd probably go to like a, a 220 grit, 320, 400, and 600 final polish. So with this being already have been polished, it simplifies our job quite a bit. We're gonna start with a 400 grit and then finish with a 600 grit. And we wanna alternate directions. And we know that Winchester on the, on the early guns uh, polished lengthwise for their final polish. So we're gonna turn for the 400 grit polish and then we'll go back with our 600 grit and polish lengthwise. Okay, so we can see that we're, we're getting a pretty good polish here already. And where we didn't couldn't see it before, let me get the camera a little closer here for you. Um, there are some, some fairly serious blemishes in this um, that are showing up now that we're, we're polishing it. So we may have to go back to like a 320 grit or even a 220 to start the polishing process because we can see that there are some a lot of marks that are showing up through here that the 400 grit isn't taken out. We may run up and down it a few times. It's kind of time consuming this polishing. We can't get in a big hurry. Okay, so actually we're spending a little more time than I expected to on this 400 grit, but it is starting to clean up pretty well. We've still got some some deep marks in here. Whoever polished it before really didn't do a great job of it, so we're having to take some of those polishing marks out. And we've still got the bottoms of, of a few pits in here that, that need to come out, but all in all it's just going to take a little more time. We're going to have to get some fresh paper now and, and just keep going after it. Okay, so we've got this tube polished up with 400 grit rotationally this way. And then we went ahead and polished it from this area down with 600 grit in the lengthwise direction, just to kind of see how it turned out. Now, the nice thing about tubes is, is with this part of it down here is not gonna show because it's gonna be under the fore end here. So it turned out pretty good. Now this, this is the original tube. It's had a rough life. This thing's had some rust, it has its bumps and bruises and dings, it's been poorly polished in the past where there's high and low spots on it. So it would be far, far easier if this was a full-on restoration to just replace it with another tube like this one. And they're not hard to come by because this is a 94 tube and they're virtually identical. There'd have to be a, a couple of minor changes uh, to make it work, but they're the same diameter, same length. Um, but. Uh, the owner really wants to, this to look at least semi-original. We're not trying to make a fake or anything, but you know, it came in with all the original finish completely gone. And, and we're gonna go ahead and, and rust blue it with the original type bluing. Um, so we're gonna leave a few little bumps and bruises in it. Now it, it's gonna take a little bit longer to do that. And it's a little more of a challenge, but it, in the end we'll have something that, that doesn't look like um, uh, just came out of a factory in, in Italy and shipped over across the sea. So how we do this lengthwise, or at least how I do it lengthwise, is I've just got a, a strip of 600 grit here and I'll just wrap it around and wrap it around fairly tight. And then we're going to go long strokes all the way down to where we're into where we polished already because we don't want to take little strokes up and down because we create those little fish hooks. If you've ever seen where people stop and go and stop and go, there's a little fish hook right at the end of each, each um, stroke. So we're going to go and then we're going to rotate just a little bit each time. And the reason for that is, is we can't keep 
um, even pressure 360 degrees around this. We're squeezing a little bit more in some areas than others. So in order to make this even, we're going to just, just rotate it ever so slightly on each time. Now this is time consuming. If this was a, a very nice, pristine, original, or not original, but um, unused tube like this one, this wouldn't take long at all. But it takes a lot longer when you've got all these little bumps and bruises and defects. That, and we don't have a lot of them in this, but we're going to leave some. So those high and low spots, it takes a while to get those things kind of blended in. So we'll... We'll go off camera here for a while because this isn't the most exciting part of uh, blue and a gun and uh, be back in a while when this thing's finished up and then we've got to start in on the other parts. All right, so we've put in the hours on the polishing of these steel parts of this carbine and things have turned out pretty well, but this was a real challenge because of the, the poor job that had been done of polishing this in the past. Um, it really took a lot of time to try to straighten it out. Now, here we've got our mag tube here. Um, again, we did leave a few little bumps and bruises in it um, to maintain a, a bit of an original look. The the uh, barrel turned out real nice. Again, this this front sight was a bit of a challenge to, to get around it and get it polished and leave the marks in, in a straight line um, around it. D difficult uh, polishing barrels and, and getting the polish marks just right on them. Then, uh, some of the other parts here. Now, now we've got a bit of an issue here. Now, we're going to slow rust blue most of these parts, but some of these parts would originally have been case color hardened. So we're going to have to do um, a little bit of aging to bring some of these parts back that we're not going to uh, slow rust blue. And, and the, the butt plate is one of them. Uh, the finger lever is one of them. Uh, so, so we're going to have to do a little bit of metal aging here. Now we're not trying to create a fake here. This, that's not what the, the goal is here. Um, the customer wants the gun to, to look appropriately aged, shall we say. He doesn't want a gun that looks like it just shipped from New Haven last week or from Doug Turnbull's shop last week. So we're going to age back some of this metal um, to try to make it look fairly correct. I mean, there are some people out there that are talented enough at fakery that you can't tell the difference. And, and I don't count myself among those. And I, I'll do the, the best that I can and we'll, we'll make it look pretty period correct. But I think pretty much anybody that, that can really evaluate the finish is going to know that this one is, is not original. And of course, the gunmetal parts that, that have been polished in the past uh, I don't know of anybody that has a process to appropriately age the gunmetal like this. This, you know, this has been polished. It's going to continue to be polished. There's nothing I can do to to age that back. But the rest of the steel parts, um, we'll take this shine off of them and uh, try to make them as as original, correct looking as possible without going into extreme measures. Okay, so this is the first part we've got aged back a little bit. You can see we've darkened this up just half an hour ago. It was as bright and shiny as, as this butt plate is now. Um, so we, we darkened it up some and, and tried to put a little edge wear on, on the edges on the front and back as, as well. So I think it turned out pretty darn good. Um, looks fairly correct for, for a 160 year old gun. Um, then we can see that we've got some parts here that are in various stages of, of rusting because let's face it, pretty much any finish that's going to uh, be durable and stay on the gun is going to involve some, some form of rusting. And then we'll get to the barrel and mag tube where we'll, we'll start in on the rust blue process. Okay, now we're to the point where we need to start the slow rust blue process on the barrel and magazine tube. Now we're using today this Brownells Classic Rust Blue. I've had really good luck with it in the past. Unfortunately, Brownells have been out of it for quite a while, and uh, it seems like pretty much everything useful Brownells been out of lately. I guess they're having supply chain issues like everybody else, but it's kind of frustrating. Um, this stuff you put on very, very lightly, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. But the first first thing is, you notice I'm, I'm gloved up here with with uh, rubber gloves. I've got uh, these the parts completely clean and decreased. Now, now that's critically important both in rust blue and caustic blue or basically any bluing um, 
So what I did is I, I took these in, I cleaned them with um, Simple Green real well, and rinsed that off, and then a good acetone wash to get all the greases and oils off of it. Um, and because any kind of petroleum or even that grease off your hands, the oils off your hands will show through that rust. So first off, let's get this. We've got a little bit of cotton here. We're going to get this in the, the solution. And then this may take a little bit of time to get just the right amount because we want a just a very bare minimum amount of solution on this cotton. If you think that you're not sure that whether you've got enough or not, um, you've got plenty. And if you think you got just about the right amount when you first get started, you probably have too much. Uh, because we just want the very thinnest coat that we can get on, on this part with this uh, rust blue solution. Any kind of puddling or uh, a spot that's got a, a little standing on top of it is, is going to etch. It's going to show through the, the finish. Um, you know, we're, do, we're doing some very fine micro pitting with this stuff. And if you get it, get it wet on the surface, it goes from micro pitting to just flat old pitting. So we're going to, I think we got this one just about right. You notice it, it took a while to get it spread out throughout. So we don't start off thinking you just need to soak this thing. And if you do get too much, then you know squeeze it out. Squeeze any excess back out. Okay, so I think we've got that just about right. Um, yeah, this, this is absolutely critical. So I, I'm spending a little time here, but I don't think I need to wring any of it back out. Okay, so let's get this magazine tube. We'll start with the mag tube because mag tube's much easier. We've got a couple of things going for it that make it simpler than the barrel. One is that this whole part of it, about the bottom third of it, is going to be hidden under the, the uh, forend. Now Winchester didn't even polish or blue this part. Um, they, they, they polished down a little bit beyond and blued mostly towards the end, but I think they did probably what I'm going to do, hang on to the bottom portion down here and then run our bluing solution out the end of the mag tube. Now, some people will take just a small piece and do overlapping strokes, and we want to just do full length strokes. We don't want to be up and down like this. For the same reason we talked about when we're polishing um, and those, those uh, fish hook patterns, well, we won't get the fish hooks here, but you'll get stop and, stop, star, stop and start marks all up and down the, the tube or the barrel. So what I like to do, rather than just doing several strokes that maybe overlap, because it's really hard to see if you get it on properly and very thin where you've been, and those overlap marks, then they can cause darker streaks. So what I like to do is, is take one longer piece of cotton like this, get it, get it soaked, and then go all the way around, and where they come together is right where the seam is that's going to be right up underneath the barrel, so it's not going to be seen. So if I mess up that one particular overlap, then it's not going to be seen. Now, there's other people who tell you that's not the right way to do it, but it's always worked for me, so that's the way I'm going to do it. So And so with this, I'm going to take one long stroke right off the end and call it good. Okay, just like that. That's all there was to it. All right, so now we're gonna get our hook in it and head on over to our um, sweat box to set it in there and start the rusting process. Now on this first application of the rust bluing solution, we actually can, can put two coats on. We'll, we'll put a coat on, and I didn't show this, but and, and then let it dry and put a second coat on to make sure we've got really good coverage. On subsequent uh, applications, we don't do that because, because we can cause streakiness um, after this first coat. Now, out here on the edge of the desert, we have a heck of a time getting things to start to rust, to, to get that uh, solution to bite and start the rusting process. So we have to use what we call a sweat box. So we've got a hot plate down here 
with a, a pan of water on, on low just to create some some humidity because in, in the summertime here humidities in the afternoon are under 10 percent and there's just no moisture in the air to rust things you can see we've got a couple of other parts in here and they went through a little bit different process that that butt plate and the finger lever those originally case colored will age a little bit differently and if we want this to look remotely like original finish then it can't have the exact same finish as the rust blued part so that's that's why these are in here that process uh, entails some some rusting as well so we're just going to suck this in here and then we'll just kind of come back and, and keep a, an eye on it usually the the first pass uh, it won't take very long for it to start rusting and subsequent passes after we've already got some some rust blue covering it then it, it takes longer and longer now our setup's a little bit different with this barrel. You'll notice we've got a piece of all thread through it and a couple of rubber stoppers on each end. And the reason for that is, is we've got a brand new barrel with brand new cut rifling and we really don't want to um, put it in a high moisture environment and then go over and boil it in water over and over and over again. We're going to try to keep that out of the bore. Now some, some, some folks don't do this, um, but I just, especially on a, on a new barrel like this, I want that extra protection for the bore. And I can see, you probably can't see it on the uh, camera, but the mag tube is already starting to rust some, so we're going to have to keep a, a close eye on this make sure we don't over rust and, and pit these parts. Now this is not a comprehensive rust bluing episode. Um, you know I'm hitting the high points because this is part of a larger uh, kind of a restoration type video. Um, if, if you're really interested in rust blue Mark Novak has some great stuff on his channel and hopefully here real soon we'll do just a, a really comprehensive rust bluing episode to, to really show you all the steps and all the intricate details that we go through to, to really get a, a, a good result. So this mag tube and barrel have been in the sweat box for about 45 minutes, almost an hour actually, and we can see that the mag tube has got a pretty nice layer of rust on it now. And the barrel is just starting to show some, some rust formation. And most likely this is a, a difference in the metals. We gotta remember this mag tube is mild steel from the 1880s and this barrel is modern 4140 barrel stock. So it's taken a little longer to rust that. It's really easy though, we wanna, we wanna boil these together at the same time. So to stop the rust process on the mag tube, we're just gonna take it out of the cabinet and we'll hang it and wait for that barrel to rust when they're pretty similar um, rust patterns then we'll take them over and boil or in, in this case steam them and uh, convert this red rust to black oxide. Now it took about twice as long to get this barrel to rust but you'll notice we got a beautiful nice even coat of rust on it. Really turned out nice. Unfortunately some rookie did the uh, cleanup work on this and and this illustrates just how important it is to get this degreased and and all the oils and whatnot and get it super clean. Wortley really wasn't so concerned about this area down here because it was going to be under the forend, right? So you can see right in here, let me zoom in on that a little bit. Right in this area here, it looks like there was some oil. See, it didn't rust at all. And so it wouldn't have mattered here because it was going to be covered up. But what happened is it picked up that oil as we wiped it along and made a streak right up the side of this thing. And that's in an area that will be seen. Now we have a couple of choices here. Now if we, we screw up when we're rust bluing, it's just a matter of polishing it off and starting over. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to boil and card this one and, and we'll clean it up really good and sometimes you can save it, it'll, it'll blend in with successive coats, sometimes it won't. Um, and so we'll, we'll give it another round or maybe two and if it's not blending in then we just have to start over from scratch. Alright, at this point we have a choice. We can either boil the parts in hot water to try to convert to that black oxide or we can steam them. And, and here I prefer to steam uh, the, the boiling process here is difficult because we have really hard water that has a lot of mineral in it and we need clean water so we, 
if we're going to boil, we're going to have to use a lot of distilled water. It takes a lot of propane um, for the pipe burners to keep that 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 uh, water boiling, and then we're going to do it over and over, heat and let it cool and heat, and let it cool. This this is much simpler. Um, of course, the steam is pure because it leaves the impurities behind that hot water mineralization in our water. Um, doesn't take much. We've got a hot plate, an old pressure cooker, and some four inch PVC and a hanger in the top. So what we're going to do, we'll take the, the lid off of this and it's really important that you have it up to temperature and a full steam. You can see, I hope you can see the steam coming out of this. If you don't, you can uh, water spot. So make sure that you're up to temperature before you put your parts in. And then at the end we want to get whatever water is condensed on here, the condensation, off as soon as possible because it can spot as well. We can spot also when we're boiling because of that mineral water that we have here, that hard water. But here this is, this is a really good um, way to convert this rust in, in my opinion. I just much prefer this steam method. We're going to put it in here. We're going to cap it. And it takes about 15 minutes. I usually let it go longer. Longer isn't going to hurt anything. And it certainly can help, especially on this, this first conversion of, of the red to black. Um, it, it usually takes a little bit longer to get the full conversion. So we'll give it about a half an hour, 45 minutes, and come back and, and see how they look. All right, it's been about 45 minutes. We're going to pull these parts out of here. I've got a heat gun here just to try to dry these parts off as quickly as possible without handling them. And the parts are going to be pretty warm, so they're, they're dry off on their own pretty fast anyway. And we'll get these parts dried off and get them uh, hung up for a little while just so the barrel cool off some because it's really hard to, to handle this barrel for a little while. It holds a lot of heat. Now we can see we've got a really nice even coat of rust on this barrel. Uh, the mag tube's not quite as even but we kind of knew that going in. We'll just have to wait and see what they look like uh, when we get them carted off. Let's head over to the carting wheel now. Alright, we're going to start with this magazine tube. We're using a very, very fine bristled carting wheel here from Brownells. It's about two and a half thousandths. You can cart off by hand with uh, four aught steel wool degreased, but the carting wheel, of course, is, is a little quicker method. We don't just hog it in there. It's a very light touch. We're just taking the, the, the loose rust off of the outside here. Now it's been a little over a week since I gave you a brief introduction to the rust bluing process. And since then, we finished rust bluing these parts. And I gotta tell you, they came out beautiful. In fact, this barrel, I think because it was a brand new barrel, and we're starting with a clean slate, it blued up the nicest I've ever done. Just a deep, dark, lustrous blue. And then we've spent the last week aging the finish, the patina, the texture of it, trying to put 160 years worth of wear and tear to make it look like original. So I got to admit, it was kind of a hard thing to do. Um, but I think it, it turned out pretty darn good and, and uh, I brought out a, a really bone stock original ranch 1866 out of the Cinnabar collection to kind of compare them to. So let's take a little closer look at at least these, this barrel of mag tube and compare them to an original 66. Now we can see here in the middle is our mag tube in the on top here is our, our barrel and on the bottom here is an original finish 1866. Now because we went through the same processes that this original did but just accelerated it, uh, we're, we're We've got rust blue and then 160 years of aging. We accelerated that here and we will manage to recreate pretty closely the same texture and patina that we have on the original. 
Now, there is one really glaring exception, and you can see the wear pattern on the original, which we don't have. So this is just too uniform to really look completely correct. And if we were into high-level serious fakery, um, we would try to reproduce that wear pattern. Now, it's easier to see on an octagon barrel because the high point edges almost always are silvered like this one is here. You can, you can see that how that's silvered. You can see some other things like on the magazine tube, the hanger is more silver than the areas around it because it took the high point wear and kind of protected these areas. So you can see those kind of wear patterns that we won't have on this barrel. But overall, this is a far superior finish to what most people age their um, metal back on firearms is just by polishing them up and putting some kind of browning solution on that that doesn't even look remotely close to the original finish. So now we're at the point we want to get all these parts all oiled up and stop this aging process and we're just about to the point now where we can start putting the old girl back together. When we get her back together then we have to function test it and that means we might just take it up on the hill and shoot a few rounds through it. Now I was just about to go over and start reassembling this old girl and I thought, you know, before I screw that barrel into the receiver, I better just check and make sure that the, these cartridges will slide easily into this chamber. Sorry about the Michael Jackson glove here. And lo and behold, we're not even close. It looks like just about the time that the the bullet itself will go into the free bore, it's being held up. So we've got a little compatibility issue here. Now I've got several different types of, of 44 Henry, both center fire and rim fire here. So I went next to these are some original 44 Henry copper cartridges that I've reloaded for a future project. Excuse me, future project. And I cast these bullets using the old West bullet molds and it does the same thing. About the time the bullet goes to the free bore, um, it's being held up. So it's an indication that the bullets are too big a diameter and, and I measure both of these, these um, factory reloads and these ones that I reloaded, I think they're about 440 and probably right out of the same bullet molds from Old West. So I went and got some original Henry's. Now these are original loaded Henry's and they come close. They're about held up about a sixteenth of an inch or so, but I think probably if we were cycling the action, they, they would chamber. And, I, and when I mic these uh, just ahead of the, the case mouth, it's, it's about 430. So we're about 10,000 smaller on these. Um, so that's probably about right, about 430, although the books say that they should be um, a bit larger diameter, like 440, and even I saw as high as 446. Now nobody shoots these 66s, so there, there isn't a lot of, uh, of uh, consistency and an opinion on what they should be. So anyway, so none of those will chamber in, in this new barrel. And all of these chamber, well, I've got three other 66s here in the shop, and they all chamber in those 66s. They're pretty, chambered pretty loose, the old originals. And if they weren't chambered really loose, then 150, 160 years of use, they've, they've loosened up. But anyway, the, the customer had, had these reloads sent here um, from Colorado Custom Cartridge, and he'd already had some made from the same outfit. Uh, these are supposedly black powder rounds and I measured the bullets on them and they're 420 so as we would expect they chamber quite easily in fact they might be a little too small so our next move is we need to slug this bore and just see what the bore diameter is on this particular barrel um, I'm kind of wondering if they didn't make it to 4440 specs rather than 44 Henry. And if that's the case, then we just need to pass on to the customer when he has his, his uh, ammunition made up, what they need to size the bullets to. Now I just finished slugging this brand new barrel and as I suspected, we came up with 428 diameter. 
And of course it made a beautiful slug, this brand new bore in this thing. And, and these later 66's had a six groove rifling so they're much easier to measure. The earlier ones had a five groove rifling and if you have a odd number of grooves then you get a high spot and a low spot opposite each other. So we got a, a good measurement on this one. So we, we're not surprised now that these cartridges that are loaded with a, a 440 diameter bullet are not chambering in, in this particular barrel. So out of curiosity, I, I thought, well, what do we, why don't we measure this original barrel, it's a six groove as well, that had the squib in it. And as luck would have it, we were able to just get the, push that squib out and it made a beautiful slug. Um, big long one here, um, and it measured out at 435. Now, I've measured some of the, the five groove 66s before, slugged those bores and measured them, and, and extrapolated that they were about 434 or so. So this kind of um, shows that, that that's, that's about where these, these 66s were. Now, the literature that I've read always says 446 bullet diameter, and, and you would assume bore diameter as well. But what I'm finding is, is that these are, are about 435. And then when I go back, I, I had just quickly measured a couple of these originals earlier, and I said 430 earlier, but when I go back and measure them a little closer, we're at about 435 there. Um, I had two or three of them that I measured were, were right in there, 434, 435, um, that one's 433. So it looks to me like these original bores, even though literature says 446, were around 435. So obviously these, these 440 diameter bullets are not going to work. They're not going to work in the original because they're, they're too big and they're far too big for this um, new rifle or this new barrel that we have. So, and probably that might not be the, the end of the world. Now that I think about it more, you know, I, I've reloaded some of these uh, 44 Henrys, and it's a chore. These heel base bullets are no fun because you got to get the crimp on them right. And, and of course, you can't run a crimp die over the top because the, the bullet diameter is the same diameter as the casing. Now, one of the things I noticed when I got to messing around with, with these that the customer had sent that had been loaded... Um, by another outfit is there's no crimp. You can pull the bullet. In fact, I, here we go. You just pull the bullet right out of it. Now these wouldn't stand up to recoil. If these were in the mag tube, um, it's going to pull these bullets right out. So uh, we got some some issues we got to deal with ammunition wise. All right, now that we've got some ammo that's going to chamber, we can start thinking about putting this old girl back together. One of the worst things in the world will be to put the gun back together and then. Uh, have to take it all back apart again if we had to do a little work on maybe polishing that chamber or even worst case scenario um, fixing a, a problem with the chamber. Um, now for any of those of you who may have a, a, a centerfire 66 that are thinking about shooting it, you're probably going to have to find somebody that can custom make the ammo for your gun and that's kind of what I've found through this process. You know, There aren't a whole lot of original centerfire 66's out there but I'm finding that there's uh, quite a few of them that have been converted. There's two of them in the shop here now and and I just talked to a guy on the phone the other day in, in Texas I think it was that has another one that he, he's kind of wanting to send up so um, they're out there but the, the ammo it's not like going down to uh, Sportsman's Warehouse and buying a box of centerfire Henry cartridges for them. Alright so now we're to the point we can, we can start uh, getting this this receiver screwed back onto the barrel and again we, we put the gloves on because we just try to handle that gun metal as little as possible to try to save what patina it has and here we have to be really careful because this gun metal brass or bronze or whatever you prefer to call it um, is very very soft easy to strip and when we when we tighten this thing up we're going to have to be really careful. We don't want to distort the thing. And hopefully that, that WinchesterBarrels.com got this thing timed and indexed up really well. And we're going to find that out here pretty quick like. We'll hang on to that saddle ring so it's not bouncing around. This darn barrel vise 
I uh, made it entirely out of scrap, but here on the ranch I didn't have a dime into it, and then I I went dirt cheap and, and bought some cheap Chinese Amazon 20-ton bottle jack, and the last couple times I've been using it, it, it bleeds off, so I've got to occasionally come down here and crank it back up again to tighten it up. Not ideal, I'm going to have to maybe find me an American-made one. <laughs> if they're out there. Okay, here we go. We're getting getting close now. This is a slow process and I, I, I'm not going to rush it. One of the things I find is when I have the camera rolling I tend to tr kind of rush things. Um, but here this is this is too critical. Getting the getting the uh, Getting the, everything all set up and this action wrench on is a really critical spot here where we can we can screw up the finish, we can distort things. We'll see when I'm editing if I, I just cut part of this out because it's a little slow and, and boring. Now these these screws or bolts that I have in this action wrench. I put some tape on them so we don't get any, any chance of marring up the finish with the threads. This action wrench is a little overkill. I built it so that it could um, tighten up stuff as big as a 76, but of course the receiver on the 66 is quite a bit smaller than a 76. Okay, so we need to have things snugged up pretty well, but we don't want to crush this. And we don't have to go very far on this one. Okay, so we're going to have to tighten this up now. Okay. So now we want to look at how far we're going here. And thankfully, we don't have to go far, and we're not going to have to crank on it which is what would be the one thing that would put us in danger of torquing this receiver out of shape. Okay, so there we are. Looks like we're just about perfectly lined up. And uh, time to the next step. We'll, we'll Get the rest of this girl all put back together and then it's time to check headspace. All right, so things are starting to come together here. We've got the front end put together and it did take a, a little bit of extra work to get these uh, barrel band screws through because we've got a brand new barrel and, and getting everything lined up, but it wasn't, wasn't too bad. And now we've just put together enough of the action to check for headspace. Now, one of the things that you probably notice if you watch this channel much is we fairly regularly run into 66s and 73s with cracked toggle links. And this one was no exception. One side was cracked. And, and I think from shooting that squib, it was, it was broken pretty badly. And nobody reproduces 66 toggle links. And, and you can make them, but it's not really um, cost-effective time-wise. And, and they're really not like the originals, unless you're a better machinist than I am. So anyway, Lee Shaver gunsmithing makes replacement 73 toggle links, but 73 toggle links are just a tiny bit shorter than 66s. So because we were having a new barrel made, I went ahead and put the new hardened uh, links in from a 73 and then had them headspace for the, the 73 toggle links. So I sent them the receiver with the links in it and everything so they could headspace it. So now it's time to, to check our headspace and actually I already did before I rolled the camera and we're with a cartridge in we're at 3000. So I mean they headspaced it great. That's just that's fantastic. I don't have a, a, a field gauge or a go no go gauge. I don't know that anybody makes them. I guess you could have them custom made but they're pretty easy to to uh, check on, on these old open top toggle link guns, you can just put your feeler gauge in between the um, bolt and the back of the case. And in this case, we've got 3000s headspace, which is right in there for tolerance wise. So we're good to go. We'll go ahead and keep going and get this thing all put back together now. 
All right, we're just about to the moment of truth where we get to function test this original 1866 Winchester, which means we're going to test fire it. But first, let's have a look at the old girl. Now, you remember this one came in completely stripped to bare metal. Um, had been done quite a while ago, and we were starting to get a little patina back. And we can see we're getting a little bit of that mustard type pattern in, in the um, gun metal or the bronze finish. In another couple decades, this might might look like it hadn't been polished. It takes a long time to get that patina in the in the uh, that gun metal uh, surface. Then if we look down here, the, the wood was actually in pretty good shape. We did uh, add a little color here on, on the butt plate. You remember it was just bright, shiny metal, as was the, the uh, finger lever here. And here, of course, we've got this brand new barrel from winchesterbarrels.com. We've got a, a nice patina on it. Again, we, we completely rust blued it to a beautiful rust blue and then aged it back. And here we are with the original mag tube. So we've got metal here that's uh, 120 years, 130 years, 140 years uh, apart from one another. So um, tried to match them up as best as possible. And then, of course, we the uh, barrel bands, we, we got them just a little bit lighter because they, they usually take more of the wear and tear than, than the barrel and mag tube. They're the high points that, that take that high point wear. And then the, the uh, rear sight, of course, we just left it. It had the original finish and, and it hadn't been scrubbed clean, so we just left it the way it was. So well, this gun that, that was just bare metal finish when it came in now has a, a much better aged appearance. Okay, so here we go. Certainly this is my first time shooting an original 1866. We're going to put one on paper first because obviously um, hasn't been shot with the, these sights. The uh, front sight's newly installed and the rear sight's been off. Okay, here we go. All right, it surprisingly has a, a fair little amount of kick. Looks like we're gonna have to tighten up that lever spring a little bit, it wants to droop. Let's go see how we did. Okay, so we we weren't bad. We're, we're about, oh, two thirds, three quarters of an inch high and left here. And we're at about 30 yards, so probably we'd be up here about maybe two and a half inches high and left at 100 yards. We're not going to burn up a bunch of ammo sighting this in for the customer. This will get him on paper and he can have the fun of, of getting it dialed right in. So after that first shot yesterday, I was pretty happy because it hit almost in the bullseye. But then it looked like we had a, a uh, pierced primer. Um, but it turned out it was just a primer strike that was way too deep. And that makes sense when you consider these 66s, most of them are pretty loose and have a lot of head space. We just put a brand new barrel on it, took up all that head space. So this firing pin, which was a homemade firing pin, was, was made to work with the, the old setup. And so it's way too deep when we, when we got the head space taken out of it. So last night I took it in on the lathe and, and shortened up that firing pin and, and shaped it up a whole lot better and should work a whole lot better now. Now the other thing I did is, uh, before I came up here today, I, I made up a, some dummy rounds and went to cycle the gun. And lo and behold, it didn't cycle. And I'm glad I found that down at the shop instead of up here after getting all set up to shoot. But anyway, the carrier wasn't rising enough, so it was stubbing the bottom edge of that, that soft lead on, the, on that sharp edge of the barrel and, and uh, not letting it go in smoothly. So we got that taken care of. We, we adjusted that carrier arm. So. But that's why we do this. That's why we function test these old guns um, before we send them back to the customer. I'd rather find out myself. And uh, besides, I like shooting them. <laughs> so, without further ado, we're gonna we're gonna put a few rounds down range and just see if we've got it right this time. Alrighty, been looking forward to this. <laughs> hey, look at that, cycled right in.
<laughs> okay, let's try a jug. Well, it sounded like it hit, but maybe these are so light it didn't uh, didn't really want to show up. Let's go that longer one out there. <laughs> it hit it. I seen it bouncing around. Okay, we'll hit that other one. We'll see if we can't hit it a little lower. <laughs> there we go. I see you're spreading water all over. Well, <laughs> it don't get much better than shooting an original 1866 Winchester now, does it? Well, thanks for joining us. This has been a long, drawn-out process. Starting off with a, a squib load and a crack barrel in this old 66. Um, seven months to get a new barrel made and then getting it all refinished and aged back and then getting it shooting but well worth the wait what a joy to shoot an 1866 winchester 140 some odd years old um, doesn't happen every day <laughs> so anyway i appreciate you coming along hope you learned something hope you enjoyed seeing this old girl shoot until next time happy trails from the cinnabar